Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Booth Western Art Museum. I'm Seth Hopkins, the director of the museum, and I welcome you on behalf of our staff, board, and volunteers to a very special afternoon I think you're going to enjoy. Before we get to our main purpose, let me tell you about a couple of things coming up at the museum over the next month or so. Our next Art for Lunch, which we do on the first Wednesday of every month, will be led this month in February by our good friend Robert Yellowlees, who's with Lumiere Gallery in Atlanta. And he will be talking about the California School of Photography, which like a lot of things in art history, has nothing to do with a real school. It's just a group of artists, they lump them together and they call them the School of. So that'll include Ansel Adams, Dorothea Lang, Perkle Jones, whose, art, whose artwork is on exhibit here at the museum right now, and many others that leads to a golden age of photography in the 40s and 50s. We will also on February 10th open our newest exhibition, the Tony Foster exhibition of watercolors from Green River, Wyoming. And our friend Karen McWhorter from the Buffalo Bill Museum in Cody, Wyoming will be here that evening to talk about that body of work. We also will have the unveiling of Tom Gillian's newest digital masterpiece. If you've been up in the galleries, you may have seen that Fort Mountain that we've enjoyed for many, many months has been removed. And there are now three video monitors up there that will carry the new project called Spirit Catcher. And the official unveiling will be on that day, February 10th. So we invite you out to enjoy both of those activities on that day. And then some of you might have heard we're having a gala. We do an annual fundraising gala here every year. And we've moved it out of February and into March this year. So it's March 8th and 9th. It kicks off with a pre-collector party out at Savoy Automobile Museum on Friday, March 8th. And on March 9th is the big event here at the museum. It starts with an artist brunch at TELUS Science Museum in the morning. We'll have our legendary songwriter series here that afternoon. And the main event will be that Saturday evening, March 9th, here at the museum. There'll be about 100 works of art for sale over the weekend, so you can add to or start your collection, and many other cool things to buy or bid on. So we invite you to get your tickets or become a Point Rider sponsor. I see several folks in the audience that are already Point Rider sponsors. Thank you for your support of the museum. Uh, quickly, how many of y'all are members of the museum? Wonderful, thank you for being here. The rest of you, we invite you to join the family and be part of the museum's family as a member of the museum. With those crass commercial words out of the way, we'll move on to today's purpose. And the objective of today's event is to strengthen and empower indigenous voices here at the Booth Western Art Museum. And we're very appreciative of the Canadian Consulate General's Office in Atlanta for helping us to fulfill this, ex this objective by sponsoring this afternoon's lecture and concert. The Consul General of Canada to the Southeast, Rosalind Kahn, is unable to be with us here today, but we do have Foreign Policy and Diplomacy Service Office, or Ashanti Infantry, with us today. Please make her feel welcome. Ashanti Infantry. Ashanti Infantry. I get it wrong every single time. I'll get it right next time. Maybe. Again, thank you to your agency for supporting the Booth Museum and for educational informative programming like this here at the museum. We really get, uh, value our friends from Canada. We've had a relationship with the consul office for many years and uh, we've had some wonderful programming here and I'm sure this will be no different. On to our speaker for today, Fawn Wood. She was born into the respected multi-generational traditional singing Wood family and in an early age, she would sing her heart out at powwows alongside her mother and father. In 2006, she was the first female to win the hand drum contest at the Gathering of Nations powwow. And if you don't know how big a deal that is, that's a big deal. In 2009, she opened the show at the 11th Annual Native American Music Awards. She is most noted for her album, Ga Gi Gay. I get that right, at least. All right, I'm one for two for which she won the Juno Award for Traditional Indigenous Artist of the Year at the Juno Awards in 2022, so just last year. Congratulations on that award. She is the daughter of Earl Wood, a musician with the traditional Cree Northern group, Northern Cree, and the cousin of Joel Wood, a musician who is a fellow Juno nominee in the same category in 2022. That had to be rough up against your cousin, wasn't it? 
This impressive performer is a Cree and Salish musician from St. Paul, Alberta, Canada, and her singing reflects her Cree and Salish tribal lineage. She's developed a style of song that mimics her relationship with her people, herself, her family, and her community. So for this first session, we've asked her to talk about the loss of indigenous language throughout not only Canada, but North America, and to talk about the efforts that she and others are undertaking to retain these languages and how music fits into that. So if you would, please give a big Booth Museum welcome to all the way from Alberta, Canada, Fawn Wood. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here and to join you all today and to share a little bit of my journey with music and the history that I know and I've experienced with music, our cultural um, revitalization and also our language revitalization because uh, what many people don't know is that uh, music has played a huge part in keeping that part of our people and our identity alive. Um, first of all, I just want to thank um, the Booth Museum for inviting me here, Seth, and the Canadian Consulate. It truly is um, it truly is a beautiful experience to be able to travel and share a little bit of what I know with anybody willing to learn. The very first, um, a little bit about myself. Um, I'll introduce myself in my language. I myself, I, I am um, a strong advocate for our Indigenous language. Um, it's one of my many passions besides creating and sharing music. Dance, get the dumps got now, fun with a cigar so yan, only check scopone coats, eh? Magame guate wig yan, man one sick. Um, name me wait then, a guan emote gate, and a gate do the yanuta, name me wait then, a wapata man gakio, I see no wakuta. First of all, I just want to greet you all. I am from the Satellite Cree Nation in Treaty 6 territory of Alberta, Canada. I am also of uh, the Statlium and Stalo people of the British Columbia territories of the Salish people. I make my home in St. Paul, Alberta, which was a Métis settlement, and today it's a, it's a really rural town and a farm town. Um, I am a singing and recording artist. I am also in my studies to um, attain my master's degree in uh, the Master's of Arts in Indigenous Languages. In fact, what inspired me to um, study language was in my own community, I noticed it was really alarming because a lot of people my age and uh, younger don't speak or understand or practice our languages. And me being a mother of three, I felt that that was really alarming. Because when, when we think of identity, when we call ourselves, especially when we, when we separate each and every single one of our tribes, one thing that really separates us is our culture, our language. And language is something that we don't just communicate in. It's not something that we just speak and, and communicate with each other. There is a whole, what we say in my language, nehyo mamto neitsigan, which is like a Cree worldview, an indigenous worldview. And there are so many important things that are, that are directly connected to our language when it comes to cultural teachings and, and traditional practices. And um, what I wanna share with you today, um, I'm actually gonna go into, into two certain styles that play a huge part in, in our modern day world um, of indigenous people that help with language revitalization. And two of them, these two styles, actually played a huge role in, um, in what taught me and what kind of helped me retain our music. And it's something I think a, a lot of people, the very first one that we talk about is um, the powwow the powwow music and the powwow celebration. Another one comes from my territory and it's kind of spreading a little bit more now and that is the round dance style. Um, one thing that, that I do wanna mention though, I'm gonna go to my next slide, is uh, the diversity that we have in indigenous music. You know, I think I was talking about this before that a lot of people, I think, um, I think one thing that we need to really share and elaborate on is that we are not all just pan-Indigenous people. We don't all share the same styles of music, the same kind of culture. We don't come from the same place. Each and every distinct tribe 
in, in North America and what we call, some people call Turtle Island and um, that goes beyond the, the medicine line, what we call the border of US and Canada, is that we, we all have our own identity our own grassroots teachings, our own cultural identity that you could hear and see in our distinctive music. Um, up on the top there is a very renowned flutist that I had the, the honor of working with on one of my albums, Mr. Carlos Nakai. He is probably one of our more well-known uh, flute players throughout, um, throughout our communities. And um, I do believe he was nominated Numerous time for the Grammy Awards. Um, right next to him on top there is a group, a powwow group that I sing with. And it's actually how I met my husband, Mr. Dallas Wescahat. And that's our powwow group we call Cree Confederation. A little story behind the name Cree Confederation is all of our singers, we come from the Treaty 6 territory, the Treaty 6 Federation. Um, a lot of our groups, all of our groups, there's three distinct styles of powwow music that you could hear. We have a straight and, and a more traditional, that it's, I guess you can call it old style. And that style of music for powwow music is you don't hear too much lyrics. You just hear all vocals. And it's almost like what you would call a melody of vocals. Um, another style of powwow music is a more contemporary style. And that's the kind that, that my group, and you hear, you hear quite common in the powwow celebrations is what we call contemporary, and we use a lot of lyrics. Even with that being said, because powwow is so widespread but, um, amongst all of our communities, you can distinctly tell if you go to enough powwows where a drum group is from by, by the, the lyrics that you hear. You can tell if, if somebody's from the Cree territory, from the Blackfoot territory, from the eastern parts, from the west coast, and it's, it's actually a really cool thing to be a part of. Um, right next to them, on the top to the right, are, are my relatives from the west coast, the Pacific Northwest. Um, my mother, is actually a Salish woman from British Columbia, but her relative and her bloodlines come right across the border. And uh, these are my relatives from Tulalip, Washington. And that is another very beautiful style of singing that you'll hear resonating out of our longhouses and our celebrations on the West Coast. And um, these are just a few examples of the, how diverse our music is and how, and how different, but, there is one thing I will, I will touch right after I share a little bit more of this is, is the one element that you'll see amongst all of our tribes. To the bottom left there is a, um, so, some singers. I know a few of them are from Saskatchewan. And um, that is a style that comes from my homeland, the round dance style, the hand drum that comes from our people, the Plains Cree people. We call ourselves the Nehiowak, a little teaching behind uh, what we call ourselves. Actually, you know what? The word Cree came from the French settlers that came to the area. And when they made first contact with our warriors, they heard the war hoop. And uh, I, I can't personally do a war hoop or a war cry, but it's, you know, I, I imagine, you know, that's why they call them the people who cried. They, that's what they were, that, that they identified our people with, the Cree people. We call ourselves the Nehuac. And the root word behind that is the Neuinu, and that means the four being people. We were spiritual people, we were emotional people, mental and physical, and all of those, and each and every single human being, we, we, we own each part of those within us. Um, another big style of music that you'll see amongst our people, and it's kind of more of a... Um, um, a celebration game is the stick games, and you'll see the elderly lady holding a bone there. And we, this is um, a story that we have behind the stick games, is uh, a long time ago when our people were feuding with each other, when we had wars amongst each other, and, uh, a Cree teaching that we had was, we have a lot of uh, really special spiritual stories and, and even creation stories, but the story behind stick game for my people is that when our people were at war with each other, even amongst other Neho tribes, we were fighting, they said that the little people beings, that is something a lot of our indigenous people believe in is the little people. They came to us and they, they seen that we were in peril. A lot of people were passing away because of these fights. And they told us, oh, I wanna give you this gift of this game so you guys can settle your disagreements. 
without, without the loss of life in your communities. And um, that was really cool. And I, I, I'll share a little bit of a, um, a stick game song with you guys. And they're really fast paced. And this is another distinct style that if you understand and you listen to enough to, of it, you'll be able to tell what players are from different places. Because we do have different styles of stick games. In the northern parts of Canada, the Dene people, they have a really high energy kind of music with them. And it's really beautiful to see because they get right into it. Um, alongside our powwow celebrations, a lot of the times they host these stick game tournaments. And that is um, my family, the Wood family, my late grandfather, Alex Wood. He was not only a rodeo man and, you know, an, an Indian cowboy, but he was really into his stick games and he was a champion stick game player. In fact, one of the songs that um, my, my dad and his brothers got to share was on an album with Canyon Records, and they called it the Wood Brothers Cree Stick Game Songs. And uh, I'll share a little, a little verse of one with you just to show you guys. I'm going to grab my rattle here. And um, it's really nice because um, when you hear a hall full of people, sometimes you'll have like about 40 to 50 players on each side of a team. And the whole point of the game is you have to try guess what side you have two bones and one bone will have a line on it. One bone will be marked and the other side won't. And you'll have two sets of these go to the opposite team. And the whole point of the game is when you go, ha, ah, and you point, you're trying to guess which side has the unmarked side. And if you win, you, you pass sticks over like that. Whoever ends up with all the sticks at the end wins. And they have big money tournaments like this throughout the US and Canada, so it's pretty cool. And uh, this is a little bit of a stick game song. That's a little bit of a stick game song for you guys. Another really beautiful style of music that I grew up listening to was uh, Sounds of the Native American Church and peyote music, NAC music, and um, the artist I wanted to showcase here was Mr. Kevin Yazzie. If you have a chance, go check out his music. It's really beautiful, and um, they do a lot of really beautiful style singing like that. I actually had the opportunity to work with him and to have him harmonize in a couple of my songs on my album, and it's, it's actually a really beautiful style of music. Um, the next thing I wanted to teach, well, I was talking about the common element that we have um, within all of our different styles and our different, and our different tribes, and, and that was the drum. In our language, we call it Mistagweski, and we refer to it as a grandfather spirit. And a story that I was told, and each and every single tribe has their own stories and their own protocols when it comes to the drum. And um, I'm sure everybody's heard that Hollywood beat, and there's a dun 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 dun. dun. That's not that's not real Indian music there. <laughs> that's stuff you see on movies. My dad used to always call it that, the Hollywood Indian beat. You know, when you hear cowboys and Indians on in those old shows like that. But um, the drum, a little story and teaching of the drum, is um, uh, we refer to it as our grandfather. And they say when you sing on it and you're beating it, you don't hit it hard because you wouldn't hit your grandpa hard, would you? You know, <laughs> it's a joke though. But um, we, um, a story of how it came to us was the creator gave us these elements and and this item, the the drum. He, uh, originally, he gave it to our our, our woman, and uh, it was a gift to us to you know to share music and and to make these prayer songs and everything like that and to use it in a celebratory way but because the women were already gifted uh with that gift of life the the ability to create life um it, she decided to pass on this drum and make it a, a male's responsibility so typically where i'm from 
you don't see too many women, well, on my dad's side, you don't see too many women who utilize the drum and who use it. So it's something that, that's kind of been a new concept for the Plains tribes, where, whereas where my mother comes from, the Salish people in the West Coast, it is really encouraged for women to sing. And you'll see that going all the way down into the states of Washington as well. I do believe the Anishinaabe people, um, the matriarchs in their communities too are also the drum keepers. Um, a lot of them don't sing with them, but they do take care of them. And we take care of this item like it was a part of our family. When we feast and when we celebrate, we do put a little, what we call like a little spirit plate away for the drum like that, and we take care of him. So that's another thing that you see kind of change, and, um, and it's a little different for each and every single tribe. To the right here, you see a hand drum. I'll be singing with that a little later. And that's, uh, you see a lot of these from where I'm from, and a lot of people in the plains of uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan, and even down into, into the Midwestern part, the hand drum. How we use it, though, I'll show you a little bit of, of uh, the beat that we use with our round dance. And then the powwow drum, that too is a little different. Um, we do also have, um, I, when you go down to the southwest or, or where they do practice Native American church, and even to the east coast where they have the longhouses, they do have a, a style of water drum to it. So that's also really great. And even hand drums are, are also very typical to the West Coast tribes, and um, but they have really big, thunderous drums. So when you walk into or you get to hear a chance of the West Coast music, their drums sound thunder. They sound thunderous, and that was to fill up the longhouse with that music. Um, I want to get a little bit into more about the origins of powwow and round dance and how that played a part in my own people's language revitalization. The next one is what we call bititi win. And that is the round dance. This is the first this is the first style I'd like to touch on with you guys. The word bititi win. Bititi is to call upon. A little story on the background of of how the round dance came to us was um our Cree people a long time ago. There was a woman and she loved her mother so dearly. She loved her so much she never wanted to get married. She stayed by her mother's side all the time until she lost her mother to sickness. And the woman was in so much sorrow and so much grief, she did not know how to, how to move on. So they say one day she was a lot walking along the plains and she seen a figure in the distance and she got closer to the figure and she realized it was her mother, only her mother's feet weren't touching the ground. And her mother told her, you know, I'm not able to, to move on into the next part of life, into the next part of that spirit world and tell you you're able to grieve me in the right way, so I'm going to gift you this. She gifted her with the knowledge and, and the, the protocols and the songs of the round dance. And, um, you know, when we talk about spirits and, and why her feet were touching the ground, you know, we do believe that uh, um, the northern lights play a big part in that. Where I'm from, we call them ganimi tozik, the ones that dance. And we see the northern lights as our ancestors. And, they, and when we typically see them where I'm from, it's in the wintertime. So when we have these celebrations, now it's more of um, um, a community dance. There's a lot of ceremonial aspects to this still, though, where we practice in the wintertime. And what we're doing, when, like you see on, on the top right picture there, that's how big our, our celebrations get back in Cree country. And what we do when we have these round dances is we're inviting all of our all of our ancestors to come and dance with us, all the ones who passed on. And it's open to everybody. Anybody can come and dance. And they always encourage everybody to come and dance at least once because you represent your line and your ancestors that are coming to visit you. Um, we A little story, too, about the round dance singing and how it plays a huge part in our language revitalization was back in the 1950s when we were kind of allowed to start practicing our ways again. Um, a lot of our people were fresh out of residential school or boarding school, and a lot of them, these youth, were so disconnected to our communities, they didn't want to speak the language anymore. They didn't want to practice our ways. 
So the elders got together, and when they started doing the round dances again, they said, because a lot of our youth weren't understanding the language, whether they didn't practice or retain it while they were in these residential schools or boarding schools, they said, well, let's start singing in English. Our round dance songs are now, today, are inspired by so many different things. You hear a lot. They're almost like country songs. They sing about love. They sing about everything under the moon like that. And a lot of them now are in our language. So what they would do is they would compose these songs in the English language to draw in all of our youth to these celebrations. And uh, it was um, to promote sobriety as well because of all of the after effects that a lot of our people had from the residential school and um, surviving, you know, the genocide of our people, not even just in Canada, but in the U.S. as well. Um, a lot of people struggled and they turned to un unhealthy ways of coping with that. I myself, uh, both of my parents are residential school survivors, so I'm a first generation away from that. Um, I was really fortunate enough, though, to have parents who kept us um, exposed to our culture, even though they both came out of a, they both came out of that. And we've been really lucky, though, and I think that's what really sparked my interest to learn. It was actually through round dance music that I was really inspired to learn my own language, because I used to have to go to my dad. My dad's a fluent speaker, a fluent Cree speaker, and I'd always go, how do you say this, dad? How do you say that? I want to make a song like this. What are they saying in that song? And he told me, you know, Fonzie, that was my nickname from him. He said, um, <laughs> like happy days. <laughs> he said, um, you should really learn our music. You should really learn our language because when you understand what's being sung, it brings a whole new beauty to that language. It brings a whole new meaning to that language. And it does. So anytime I do share uh, music in our language, I like to translate it before I sing it so everybody can kind of take it in the way it's meant to be taken. Um, the typical beat for the round dance beat, I'm going to show you on my drum here. And this comes from, like I said, our people. It sounds like a heartbeat, but it's not the dun 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 dun. This is what we call a scratch. And you'll hear this now. Imagine having 30, 40 singers in the middle of our one of our community halls, and they, they sing the songs in the middle there. And we have protocol songs that we start our ceremonies with and whatnot. And um, but the beat's like this. It's actually really cool. And um to talk a little bit more about uh, the revitalization of language nowadays, you hear a lot of it, the, the, the intention of the English songs being introduced into this ceremony, into our celebrations is still there. We see a huge surge now in our communities, um, where I'm from too, especially of youth coming. And it's such, a, it's such a thing to wear your ribbon skirt and go to the round dance and dress up and you know wear our, our jewelry with pride. And it, it's, it's a beautiful thing to see the identity of the people really shine through our music and our songs. Um, I'm gonna show you guys a little clip of, of a live. This was actually, the next clip was taken from a really big, uh, throughout, the, throughout the holiday time, we spend about 13 nights straight, you can go to round dances and they happen all night long, right into the early mornings. And it's actually really cool because you travel, we call it the holiday round dance trail. And we feast, there's giveaways, you know, you visit your other friends from other communities. And this will give you a little taste of how it sounds and what it looks like to dance at a round dance. That was a little bit of that. And um, a little song I'll share with you guys now. And, um, because me and my partner, we both worked uh, uh, with immersion in our schools and our communities. We always make it a point to share songs that are, that are easy for kids or anybody, beginner speakers, to pick up on. And uh, one time we came up with this, it was a morning song, a, kind of like a prayer that we used to share with our kids in the morning, and we turn it into a round dance song. And it's... Um, um, it's called Nanaskamun. And in the song I say, Nanaskamun a wanskayan. I'm thankful I woke up today. Ewa pataman kutakisagao. And I seen another day. Nanaskamun tatukisagao. I'm thankful every day. So I'm going to sing a little bit of it for you guys and give you a taste of how it feels to hear our language in, in that style of song. 
Nanas come on, hell and sky on, hell a pataman, good tack, kiss a cow. Nanas come on, tattoo, kiss a cow. Hey, oh, hey, oh, hey, oh, way, ah, ay, ah, hey, way, ah, hey, ah, hey, ah, ay, ah, hey, hey, ah, ay, ah, hey. Hey ya, hey ya, we hi ya. Hey ya, hey ya, hey hey ya. Hey ya, hey ya, hey hey hey. Hey yo, hey yo, hey yo. Hey, oh. A little bit of the Nanaska Um Another thing um, that a lot of people hear when they think of indigenous music is powwow. You know, there's even that saying, oh, we're going to have a powwow, like a gathering. Um, powwows are open to everyone. And this is something that you see throughout the U.S. and Canada. A lot of our communities take pride in how they host these celebrations. And I think a common misconception is that powwows are only meant for Indigenous people, and that's not true. In fact, powwow has a hu plays a huge part in language rev revitalization throughout all of our communities. Like I was mentioning earlier, that particular style that uses a lot of the language is what we call contemporary powwow music. It's really high energy and you hear language being spoken. There's all kinds of different um, stories and, and, and meanings to each and every song. One song I wanna share with you guys, a little part of it is called the Treaty Six Flag Song. And um, up, in the, up in the top here you see it says Red Bull Singers. They were one of the, they were actually the very first Cree group to start singing in our language with powwow music, and they composed this song. They composed this song in honor of, of the late Queen Elizabeth, when they, and it was to si symbolize when our people signed the Treaty Six um, Agreement, peace treaty with her. And in this song, we're talking about, um, um, Gecho Gema Squo is what we called her, and that's like the big chief woman, the big leader woman, like she's the boss. And uh, she gave us this land as, as long as the flag is flying, and that's what, that's what this song. And any time at a powwow when you go, they always start off with what they call the grand entry. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with powwow, but each and every single day before they start the session of the day, they'll have a grand entry where they parade all of the dancers and, and um, the singers will sing for them. And that's kind of something that, to my understanding, that we picked up from from uh, even rodeos or, or the Wild Bill show that they used to have when they would parade the Indians in like that for the showcase. But it's something that we still practice today, only now there is a lot of elements that, 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 we, really, that we really try focus on, like honoring our veterans. You know, warriors in our communities are really highly, and ho that we really hold them in high, high regard. Um, some of the, the, the big picture on the left there is a, a celebration that comes from the British Columbia area, Kamloopa Powwow, and that's always one to, to attend. I, I do understand you guys have powwows in this area too, and I encourage you, if you are interested, go check it out. Powwows are for everybody. It's a really good immersive experience for anybody who kind of wants to get a taste of the culture. And um, so back to the song the Treaty Six Flag song. I'll sing a little bit of it with you. And whenever me and my group, we get to go sing places, we take a lot of pride in singing this song because um, whenever we get asked to, to sing a flag song when they're about to bring the flags in, this is the song that we like to sing because it represents our people. <laughs> Hey, 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 hey,
आहे काकी के कावे वे पास्तान आहे आहे ओ That was a little bit of a flag song for you. <laughs> Again, touching on some of these groups, I was talking about, a, um, about how some of our groups have really been able to take this style of music to a more widespread eye and, and, and to these international stages. Um, these people, in, uh, with, uh, the picture with the, the gentleman with the yellow vest and the group there, that's Northern Cree. And my uncle Steve is actually the, um, the captain of, of that drum group. And they've been nominated numerous times for Grammys. And uh, they've traveled all over the world showcasing the style. And them, they've also been some of the pioneers when it comes to sharing Cree language through music. Um, also down here, I do believe this is the Mandaree singers. They sing more uh, what we call straight style singing, not too many words in their style. Um, I'm going to show you guys a clip of the group I sing with, and that way you can kind of get a little bit of a taste of the energy that comes along with power music. As you can see, that's really high energy music. And when you stand by it, a lot of people are like covering their ears if they're not used to it. But it's something that you feel right to the like right in into the into your the depth of your soul almost, like the spirit. And um a beautiful thing about that now is um is that you see that being shared a lot more. And it plays a huge part in our language revitalization because like I said, these distinct tribes, that powwow is something that we share amongst all of us. It's throughout all of indigenous North America and you can see a lot of our singers and our song composers utilizing our language that way. And uh, our youth are really picking up on it. And sometimes this is their first exposure to our, our, our music is uh, through powwow. And it's becoming a cool thing. I always say that, you know, some of our powwow singers are looked up to like rock stars in our community, which is really awesome. Um, talking about how it kind of, um, how it's fusing with nowadays and, and getting into mainstream music is a, these are three people I wanted to showcase, but there's so much more. The young lady to the left is my little sister, Tia Wood. And she's actually the first indigenous woman to sign with Sony Music. And we're really proud of her. I'm the oldest and she's the baby. And I, I, you know, to be able to see and witness her, her journey with music and language and still staying true to herself and her culture and where she's from has been a really beautiful thing. I know she sometimes messages me and asks me how to say this. Like she just messaged me before I started my presentation. How do you say bugs? And I was like, I gave her the word for bugs. But yeah, she is the very first um, indigenous woman to sign with Sony Music. And she has a really beautiful style. I'm actually going to show a clip of her after I'm done talking about, about the, these three artists I wanted to. Another one is um, the hallucination. You know, these guys are amazing DJs. And you hear them use a lot of our music. And uh, the way they mix it is so beautiful. In fact, a lot of their music is used in, in movies and TV shows, documentaries. And these guys, I, I had the pleasure to meet them. They're really amazing when it comes to empowering our youth. And I think that's where language revitalization needs to start with is, is focusing our youth and nurturing them and, and exposing them and making those connections to each and every single one of our communities so that they feel comfortable and they feel empowered to learn our language and retain that. 
Um, the person on the right here, he is a former member of the, a tribe called Red, which is now known as the Hallucination, but that's DJ Shub. And I had, uh, he just released, I think it was his very first solo album, and it was called War Club. So if you have a chance, check that out. He showcases many different traditional singers on there as well, from the Eastern parts of uh, Canada and the U.S. to, I was the, I had a chance to do a song with him as well, and it's called Redfoot. It's one of my son's favorite songs that I, he doesn't like a lot of my music, but he likes that song. <laughs> But it's a really beautiful thing to see now, to see the bridges being built for not just our own communities and our own people to listen and hear our language and our music, but for anybody to come and enjoy in different styles. There's so many different genres now that are represented by our people. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of nice to say that we are more than just drums and, and singing traditional. That it's, it's a beautiful way of life it is. But to see us branch off and share that and make this these um, avenues of exposure to other people to show what kind of talent that we have with our people. And uh, I want the next clip I'm gonna show you is actually a little bit of my, my sister Tia. And I, was, I took this clip the very first time that I got to see her sing live as a professional artist. And um, it was at the Women in Music um, gala in, in Toronto, Ontario last, last year. And, and you'll hear, you can hear her distinct style it's very contemporary. She sings a lot of R&B, bluesy kind of things, and uh, but she still has that that native flair, that that indigenous flair to it. So I'll show you a little bit of that. And that was my little sister, Tia. Uh, closing remarks for this. I, I like to leave a little bit of room for questions as well, though. But when it comes to um, the origins and the new mar modern day music that comes from all indigenous people all over, like I mentioned, one of the most important parts is, is being able to share our story and our history with people. And I think that plays a huge part in, in kind of um, the whole holistic identity of our people. Language to me has been become probably one of my, my biggest passions because of music and because of the way I see it, how it affects people and how it makes people feel. And um, I always encourage people, actually back home, I, I started, I got asked to do um, a province-wide radio show that we call the Cree Chatter Hour. And it's aimed towards encouraging people to speak our language, where we give people everyday phrases, we share music within, um, within our language too, to help people, uh, indigenous and non-indigenous people alike. And um, so we do that, and I think I'm really thankful for music and the, and the role it's played in my life and the journey it's brought me. And I look forward to sharing my musical journey with you guys uh, this afternoon at the performance. And um, I'll share a lot of songs, and you'll hear a lot of where I come from and a little bit of my story along with those songs. Um, I keep getting messages from my, my son here. So I want to say hello to my kids at home, Ambrose and Ava and Alex and my husband, Dallas. Uh, him too as well. He's played a huge part in, um, in why I started composing music in the first place. I used to always think that, um, you know, we, 
with these styles of music and uh, women kind of indigenous women stepping into the light as song composers and singers again you know we're 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 really witnessing a big surge in that matriarchal energy in our indigenous communities and they are leading the way of revitalization of language and, and culture so when i started composing music it was my my husband who really encouraged me um, to give a voice to our Indigenous women through music, to tell our stories, to share stories that only we could share, even through music. So it's been a really beautiful journey, and I'm really thankful for it. And uh, anywhere I go, I always like to encourage people to, to really embrace where you come from, your grassroots, and to practice any kind of language that you can, even if it's by one word a day. In fact, one of my, my, old, my instructors, who was an elder, we used to have elders come into, into our learning areas and talk to us. They say language is a spirit and it's, e it's in each and every single one of us. And it's, it's up to us and how we invoke it and, and awake it. And um, we have what they call that genetic memory in our communities. And it's there and it's always there and it's always been there. And uh, that's something I'm witnessing on my own language journey because it's opened up a whole new world view. And I just want to say thank you to you guys for listening to me talk. I know I'm kind of a, a talker, so this was a good time for me to come and share with you guys. But if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask. And uh, I hope you guys will join us this afternoon for, for the musical concert part of the presentation. Hi, hi. Gananaskumpnawa. Hi, hi. You know what, I, I can safely say I've probably been to both the East and West Coast. Um, just last year I was able to go visit the Seminole tribe in Florida. I've been all the way up to the Northern Territories of Canada, the Eastern Coast of Canada and the US, all the way down to California, up that coast and everywhere in between almost. And this is my first time here, so I was really excited. The range of the Cree people, you know, they, they say we, um, we actually, our origins go back to the Hudson Bay area and the northern parts of Ontario and Quebec. And uh, our, um, our root speaking language where we are rooted is out of the Algonquin language. And I was actually just talking about this with a person the other day is that we have so many sister languages and we are probably one of the bigger populations in Canada. Um, many different dialects we have. Where I'm from, we are called the Plains Cree, and it's a wide dialect. We have Woodland Cree, Swampy Cree. Um, uh, we even have Michif. There's, there's about four or five different dialects in Cree alone. And actually, in the United States, there is only one indigenous community that speaks Cree, and that's in Montana, just across the border, and that's the Rocky Boy Chippewa Cree people, and I actually have relatives down there, but we are spread out all throughout um, Ontario in that area, uh, Quebec, northern Quebec. I've got to visit a community up there called Chisasabi, and it's a beautiful thing because in more of those remote territories, um, Cree and their indigenous languages are actually their first languages, but we spread all the way down throughout the prairies and the plains right down into Montana. The policy, the policy, and the um, I think boarding schools and residential schools went throughout the U.S. and Canada. It was everywhere. I know down here in the U.S., one big one that they talk about a lot was the Carlisle School, and um, I actually got to go visit uh, Yankton, the Yankton Nation in South Dakota there, and I I seen one of their big schools down there, but um, a lot of these places. Um, uh, I don't want to say most of them, but a big chunk of these, these communities that had these schools in there, 
They were often overtaken and converted into places of higher education for our people where they could celebrate um, learning language and culture like universities. In fact, the university that I'm studying at now for my own language was the very, it's called Blue Quills University. And it used to be the Blue Quills Residential School where my own father went to school and he was forbidden to speak our language, but now they offer um, bachelor's programs and master's programs to teach people to become linguists and language teachers. So it's been everywhere. Yeah. One first time, um, what is the estimate of the percent of Indian children that were forced into those schools? You know what? I think the majority of the generation before me, we were very, it's very rare that you hear um, when you talk about the percentage of the indigenous children who had to go to school, it was very rare and few and far in between when you hear of somebody who didn't get to go, who didn't go, mostly because it was family or people in their community that would hide them when they were being collected. And I remember even my dad telling me stories about that. And that was another thing, like it, it's, uh, people talk about it like it's something in the far past, but it was only one generation ago. And I even have people who are maybe 10 years older than me that were still a part of that. The res I think the last residential school closed in Canada, I believe it was in 1996. That was the last one, yeah. See the young gentleman at the top there. Oh yeah. Uh, where are you from? Where am I from? I'm actually from Alberta, Canada. My community is called the Satellite Cree Nation. Do I participate in the gathering of nations? You know what, it played a huge part in my career after I was the first lady to win the hand drum contest, but I'm actually a part of the hand drum committee at the gathering of nations now. Tell them what that is and where it is. Uh, the gathering of nations is the world's biggest powwow celebration in Albuquerque, New Mexico. It's been going on for years, and that's always a powwow that I think uh, everybody should go to at least once. It's, it's a, a beautiful experience. Not only do they celebrate through the powwow celebration, but they have an indigenous showcase there, an indigenous market, and it's become one of the, the bigger celebrations for us. Um, the time of year that the Gathering of Nations is held, it's actually coming up. It's, uh, I believe it's the third weekend in April, and um, it's a pretty big deal. It's a really awesome thing to be a part of. My language, it, we've been fortunate enough to have it in the local schools and not even just in our, in our indigenous schools that are in our communities, but they are now offering it in, in off-reserve schools for the children, for both non-indigenous and indigenous kids alike, which is really good. And actually about 40 minutes from where I'm from, they have the first immersion, the full immersion school where it starts from preschool, kindergarten, all the way up to grade five, where every single, um, every single class that they teach, math, science, everything is all done in immersive Cree. And I've got to visit that. It's in a place called uh, Onion Lake Cree Nation. It's a, really, it's a really beautiful, I got to visit there once. It's a beautiful thing to see. I do believe you had a question. Oh yeah, um, my attire actually, these are all, I, I, anytime I get a chance to perform or showcase, I always try to, they always say dress your best. That's the way we, we were taught whenever you go somewhere. And this is my best kind of clothes. I always call them, um, this, is, um, this was made by a young girl from, I do believe she's from Saskatchewan. And um, all of this was artist friends that I befriended or found like uh, through social media. A big part of this is my dentalium necklace. It was made by Russell McLeod, and uh, this is Russ Ware. My earrings and my necklace here is made by um, a lady from around my area called Bear Roan, and her whole family is uh, a family of really talented Cree artists, and my belt is a brass belt, and he is probably one of the top belt in leather workers in, in our indigenous communities. His name is Long, Long Whisker Brass. You can find him on social media, but you gotta check him out. He has really beautiful work. Um, anytime I go anywhere too, I always save my best shoes. Well, they're not my shoes, but my moccasins. They're Cree style wrap-ups. 
And um, you see me wearing a lot of florals, and our Cree people, we are actually are really, uh, florals really represent us, and um, that's what I chose to wear for you guys today. Many of you know this is a rescheduled program and we had to move it uh, to today. It originally was scheduled on a very important day on the Canadian calendar as relating to Indigenous people. And I wanted to ask Fawn if she would wrap up by telling us about that special day. And it's something that Canada has done for many years now. And maybe it's something that will come to the U.S. at some point. I do believe that um, one of the special holidays that we have is um, Orange Shirt Day and the Day of Truth and Reconciliation. It's kind of a day for our whole co that our whole country recognizes to kind of reflect back on the history of the Indigenous people. And now our government is making motions um, where they are trying to um, better that relationship and, and also acknowledge the history that our people have going through. And that has played a huge part in, in the revitalization of our people, of our identity, of our culture, and uh, also of our traditions. And it's, it's a, you know, like anything else, it is a work in progress. But over, I'd say even in the last decade, there has been a lot of effort and a lot of big steps taken to really um, acknowledge that and to also put that empowerment back in our people to to be who we are, who we're meant to be. And it's been it's been a really beautiful thing to witness. And you see a lot of moves and a lot of things being taken place north of the medicine line, what we call the border, to really help restore that for our people. Yeah. How about it, everybody for fun? And again, thank you to the Canadian Consulate for helping us put this together. We really appreciate their partnership on this. Uh, we'll be adjourned until 3.30 when we'll have the concert portion of today's events. Uh, until then, there's a reception going on uh, down in our ballroom area of the museum. If you don't know where that is, just follow the people who know. And uh, they won't lead you astray, I'm sure. And we'll be back here at 3.30. Thank you. <laughs>